This is Core Conversations composing Drupal's future. It's just going to be me, Larry, and Klausi. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll decide what we're going to do. Exactly. We'll make awesome. That's the decision making process. All right. <laughs> well, we're up against two really awesome sessions right now. No, there's um, Angie. Angie's doing um, Angie Aquia, whatever is yeah, upgrade your module to D8, and there's the B Hat Lab going on right now as well. Yeah, it's front end package, man package management. Yeah, I have no idea. Are Are you asking me to justify you leaving my session? <laughs> Oh no 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 no! Totally not. Yeah no, I don't I don't think so at all. So okay, well um, I am going to get started then. Uh, this is uh, composing Drupal's future. Look at that. It's got stuff in it. I probably should have filled in. Um, I'm Chris Vanderwater. Uh, I'm with Commerce Guys. I'm a senior developer there. Um, I am at Eclipse GC on Twitter. I'm also the Drupal 8 uh, Blocks and Layout Initiative owner, commonly known as Scotch. I do a little bit of maintaining of C tools whenever I can get around to it, and a little bit of maintaining of my own module, Context Admin, you know, when I feel like it. Um, so those are uh, just some quick about me. Welcome. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the objectives that I have for this conversation, um, because what I'm suggesting here is kind of crazy uh, to a certain degree and kind of sane on the flip side of that coin. But at the same time, uh, I think it's good to lay out some objectives that I would like to see uh, both for the conversation and uh, if ultimately we end up doing this for Drupal in general. Um, so the things that I really want to hit here are componentization and what that means to me in terms of uh, Drupal and PHP in general. Uh, interoperability, both with our own components and with other components. And then uh, what, it, what I hope that ultimately leads to, which is the ability to give us more influence in the greater PHP community through expo exporting our code and our culture to them, and ultimately our expertise. So let's talk a little bit about componentization uh, here. Um, Symphony has a definition for this, and I looked for a little while to find it, and uh, so I'm just going to read this to you. Symphony's definition of components is, is this. Symphony components implement common features needed to develop websites. They are the foundation of Symphony full stack framework, but they can also be used standalone even if you don't use the framework, as they don't have any mandatory dependencies. That's a, a very interesting kind of mission statement almost for the code that they're building. Um, and so, so I looked around and I said, well, does Drupal have one of these? And I didn't find one at first, uh, uh, so I made up my own. And uh, so that's why there's a question mark here. I said, uh, maybe uh, Drupal components provide common features needed for a modern CMS. They provide the foundation of Drupal, but can be used standalone with limited dependencies. There is actually a definition for this if you go looking within Drupal component. Um, which I happen to have open right here. <laughs> so the official Drupal statement of what a component is is this. Drupal components are independent libraries that do not depend on the rest of Drupal in order to function. I, I am reading from a readme in Drupal core, by the way. What are you doing? <laughs> Mail's telling me I need to be doing stuff, probably. Go away. OK. That's what I get for not closing everything. Uh, components may depend on other components, but that is discouraged. Components may not depend on yeah, blah, blah, blah. You can read this. It's in uh, here. I'll show you where it is. Uh, it's in core lib Drupal component, readme.txt, right? Suffice it to say we have one. Uh, and of course, why me? So I kind of wonder what PHP's definition is for this. Uh, I couldn't find one. But I bet it's something having to do with this works standalone and you can just use it, right? Uh, because that's what the rest of our good examples here are kind of getting at. So 
Let's talk a little bit about Drupal 7. Um, we've kind of done this before. To a certain degree, uh, includes were kind of components. Some of them were swappable. You could write your own include file that had all the exact same function names and then swap out certain things like, say, maybe session or there, there were a few of these. Password. Password was the more common one. I actually wrote a module to do that for you and was very scared. Um, when I stopped hashing passwords and just saved them clear text. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, modules are, are kind of sort of this idea, right? Um, you know, at least if you think of it in terms of Drupal, when you go asking for a module, you say, um, I expect this self-contained bit of code. It may state that it has some dependencies on other stuff, but it's gonna slot into the system that I'm choosing to use, and it's just gonna work there. Um, so this is, you know, conceptually not that different. So to a certain degree, we, we kind of invented this before PHP got around to it. And I'll show how PHP's gotten around to it here. Uh, in Drupal 8, we have very consciously chosen to begin componentizing things. And um, so the real components live in Drupal component, which was the readme I was just reading from. And um, then there are extensions of those uh, and some more standalone things like database TNG uh, that live in Drupal core. Uh, and ultimately, I think uh, we can probably start to really seriously componentize all of these things because what these encapsulate to some degree are a no assumptions feature component of a system like Drupal. And then our Drupal core code is basically the Drupal assumptions layered on top of that. And um, that's actually kind of a valuable thing. What we haven't done is we haven't really begun replacing it with regard to modules. Uh, modules are still modules are still modules. We have a .module file. Um, the .module file can have hooks in it. Um, more importantly, when you look at a module, modules can have classes in them. And these classes can be componentized in the exact same way that code within core can be componentized. The problem is, is that they aren't abstracted enough to be reused. They exist within a Drupal module, so they are bound to Drupal. And as we've shown with a few uh, interesting pieces that have gone into Drupal 8, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. For example, date module doesn't really exist because we have a date component now. There may be a module that interfaces it to Drupal. I, I don't know. I think there probably is uh, for fields and those sorts of things. Um, but in, in terms of of really beginning to adopt what the rest of PHP is doing, you look at Symfony and their bundles, and, and they're not the only people doing this, but they're the one we're going to identify with the most. Symfony bundles are very, very close to being Drupal modules um, in many respects, only they have some advantages we don't have, like being able to generate a class map because all of their bundles are inside of their composer documentation. So, so I'm standing up here asking a couple of questions, and amongst them is, do we even need module files? In Drupal 8, the answer is yes, because we haven't gotten rid of hooks. Um, but in Drupal 9, maybe, maybe not. Um, so let's talk a little bit about interoperability. Um, if we didn't have any modules, how do we operate, both with ourselves and with the rest of the world, right? Because we've done this for so long, um, you know, that becomes a really important question to answer. And uh, so the first step in doing this is to really begin conforming, conforming to a namespace-based class name spec, right? And we're doing that in Drupal 8. In fact, our modules are doing it now. Um, if you open up a class that's inside of a module, that class has a full namespace based upon that module already in there. Um, so views, for example, if you've ever looked at a views class, of which there are many, um, they will have a namespace on them that tells you this came from views, right? Um, I don't need to get too detailed with that. Just suffice it to say you can just look at any individual class and have a really good idea where it came from because they have independent naming mechanisms built in. And this is something that was developed outside of Drupal. We just adopted it. So when I start talking about componentization, uh, this is what I'm talking about. These things, which are already namespace, they can't, by design, collide with anything that's not just named identical up at that very high level. Um, and, and there are some interesting things to help you separate that apart too. Um, 
we can leverage Symphony's event dispatcher or something similar. Um, event dispatching is ba basically giving classes the ability to respond to hooks um, instead of having a dot module file that responds to hooks. And that's really compelling on a number of levels, um, especially because it means that every class in your, in your library of classes could potentially respond to a given hook. It's not likely that it would. <laughs> and only classes that implement certain interfaces can. But what it means is that a collection, which we think of as a, as a module, could actually subscribe multiple times to the same event. We cannot do that in hooks right now. You have switch statements, and you have to follow logic and figure out what's going on. Uh, and we did a lot of things to mitigate that during the D8 cycle, but there's still plenty of it there. And a full-on adoption of the event dispatcher out of Symfony gives us the ability to do away with dot module files, by and large. And it gives us the ability to really begin packaging up our individual software components in such a way that they could be run outside of Drupal. <coughs> brings me to my next point. By doing this, we set our code free, right? We begin to, um, when you look at our info files, which have become info YAML files, but whatever, they state their dependencies. If you look at a composer file, it states its dependencies. It's basically just a metadata wrapper that's most important job is to state its dependencies. That's what an info file really is, right? It's a metadata wrapper that tells you its dependencies, so you never end up with something you can't actually run. So, I mean, in these terms, Composer, PSR0, Packagist, which I haven't talked about at all, but I will, um, like, these replace something we invented almost a decade ago. And we adopted it most of the way for Drupal 8. If we adopt it all the way during the next cycle, we could find ourselves in a situation where we can actually begin to use our code on something that's not strictly Drupal. And so I, I asked the question, if database TNG were out in the wild and plugins were out in the wild and entities were out in the wild, and you could just pick one up, grab any of the additional Drupal dependencies it might have, and drop it into a non-Drupal project, would you? More importantly, if somebody not in the Drupal community found a full featured system that did what they wanted and it just happened to come from Drupal, would they use it? And if they did and had a problem with it, who would they call? <laughs> Which is where we get to exporting our code and exporting our culture. Um, I think it's a really important point that um, we make these easy to include. And luckily, between Composer and Packagist, uh, we can do that. For those of you who may not know, um, Packagist is a site that keeps track of uh, various Composer components. And uh, Composer leverages that site when fulfilling the requirements of those components. So if you've ever used something like Drush, PM Download, or DL, or you know Drush Make, anything like that. It's actually more akin to Drush Make than it is anything else. Because you can have a single Composer JSON file that says, I need these things. And then you run Composer install. And it grabs all of those things. And anything in that that says, I need these things, it goes and it gets those. And it proceeds to do this until it has all of the various dependencies that are required. And then it dumps that all in a place that it knows about. And boom, you have all your code. And you can begin developing. Um, so yeah, that's what I just said. Uh, so these, these systems all leverage the, the class auto-loading and namespacing I was talking about earlier. Uh, Packagist, Composer gives you the actual code base. Um, but it's pulling these code bases from all over. Some of this might come from GitHub. Some of it could come from Drupal.org. Some of it could come from, you know, a Git server that just happens to be public to the world. So long as it is, we can get it here. So um, it, it means that if it's easy to include, which these tools make, uh, and the rest of PHP is using these tools, then when they find them, I think it will be natural for them to include. Um, and so packages specifically can help you find out whether a namespace already exists, and you can create code in a different namespace, and people can begin browsing for it. It's like a module browser, but it's for all of PHP. You know, Guzzle's in there, Symphony components are in there, Doctrine's in there, Ascetic's in there. Why aren't Drupal components in there? 
right? Why, why are we the only people benefiting from our code? Um, and of course, if people begin to include our projects in theirs, they will come looking for us. And they will probably begin contributing at least to the projects they're using, if not to other projects that expand on it. Because if entity is dependent upon plugin and they find entities and they find plugins, you know, at some point they're probably going to want to contribute to both of those things something. So I, I've had the, the good fortune of um, picking Angie's brain a little bit on this. Uh, and the next two slides are really, like I put these there because I had a long conversation with her and she had a lot of objections and I think that they're really valid. Uh, so I'm just gonna like show my cards completely here because I don't really wanna be holding anything back. Uh, when we start discussing this, we're really talking about packaging core, right? Uh, because the way we package core is completely different than how we package any install profile that exists on Drupal org. org. Uh, it's completely different than how pretty much any Drupal project anywhere is packaged. And what we'd be talking about is basically a package standardization of sorts, which means we're going to have to write some serious tools, right? We're going to have to change the way we're doing thing, things. Um, it also means if we begin to take code and extract it out of Drupal and make it available to the rest of the world, that we have some serious problems with regard to our existing core gateways. Um, I maintain to a certain degree that we already have this problem because we've included third-party code. But the fact remains, you know, uh, I continue to use the plugin system as my example because from day one we designed it to be able to live outside of Drupal core and I have some really great examples of it doing so. Um, but, you know, from a documentation perspective, like, if I were just in charge of that Git repository, I could technically do anything I want. I wouldn't, but I could. Right? So if I didn't document stuff properly, or it weren't performant, or there were an accessibility issue, uh, composing Drupal's future? Composing Drupal's future, or are you looking for the lab? H. Um, needless to say, the gateways exist for a reason, and we probably need to come up with a way to continue to conform with them, even if we begin abstracting code out. And if we have multiple Git repositories that these that the documentation people have to deal with, like they're not gonna be super happy with me, right? So we have some hurdles to, to get over here. Um, in addition to this, I'd just like to point out that like maintenance and ownership of the code base becomes uh, a, a bit of a topic. And I just wanna say, first of all, it's not about control, right? It's about iteration. If I have my way and I got to separate plugins out from Drupal 8, Right, that'd be like, let's say 1.0.0. By virtue of the fact that anyone on the planet is using that, I've kind of already given up control of it. To a certain degree, really all I can do is to begin to fix bugs. Um, I might be able to add new features so long as they don't break backward compatibility, but I can't go breaking something in there, otherwise all hell breaks loose. What I can do is create a new branch and do a 2x while Drupal 8 runs on 1x. And if I find that I've hit the end of that life cycle and I begin a 3x and we get that to stable before Drupal 9 ships, I got a full iteration into the plugin system before Drupal 9 got out. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. By the same token, if it's stable enough and doesn't go anywhere, there's really no harm in just staying on 1x. So, um, you know, we have to begin thinking about long-term support releases because that's essentially what these are. Like you look at the development lifetime of a Drupal release and a 1.0.0 code, a 1x code of um, something that we extract from Drupal has to support Drupal 8 long-term because that's at least a three-year commitment, at least, probably more like a five or six-year commitment. I'm getting nods. Um, So that's kind of where I'm at at this point. I'm hoping you all have some thoughts that you would like to share. One thing I want to clarify, are you talking about taking stuff from Drupal component and moving it out to develop in a separate repository? Or are you talking about what Symfony does, which is everything's developed in a single repository, but they do some git magic so that every commit, <coughs> the components get pushed out to their own repositories that are read only and those are listed on packages. I think that that is an implementation detail. 
Um, I'm not horribly swayed one way or the other. I think the big benefit of them being separate repositories means that you can literally put lieutenants in charge of them. I don't know whether we can do that with submodules. Um, that's, I'd say that's more the uh, implementation detail. The main difference <laughs> is if it's a common repository, then it follows our development cycle, right. which means we can still enforce all of the gates on that code. If it's a separate repository, then we can't enforce those gates. Whether that's good or bad is a separate debate. Right. Um, so I, I think that that's, you know, that's kind of into the difficult problems side of this um, that I don't really have answers for. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in throwing out questions and seeing what the answers are three to six months from now to a certain degree, um, especially on, on the really, like, like that stuff, I don't have answers to, right? Um, and no one in here is a, a core maintainer. So, and I, I mean, they're the people who are going to have the experience to know just exactly how much of a problem this sort of thing might be in their development cycle. Um, but, you know, by the same token, I think it's worth discussing because, like, the ultimate objective here has to be one of, like, like I said, it's not about control, it's about iteration. And I think this is true for Drupal core as well, because if we begin to componentize what we already have sitting there, and, you know, I say put lieutenants in charge of that who are already, like, very invested in that code and can be trusted to maintain it for a given release, you know, then what we, what we end up with is a whole bunch of people who are taking care of a whole bunch of problems and keeping a unified API on the edges. And it turns Drupal into basically an interpretation of how those components should work together. It reduces the size of Drupal core significantly, which means we can iterate a whole lot faster. People keep talking, oh, we want a one-year development cycle. Good luck. But I'm, I'm offering you something that in the long term might buy us that, right? In the long term, if we invest what it takes to begin abstracting these things out into standalone components that either provide a, a cohesive, this is what I do, or are a Drupal interpretation that extends that, you know, we've greatly reduced the amount of code we have to maintain within yeah. Drupal core while not really forfeiting any of the benefits of Drupal core. So um, yes, it, it does bring about some specific objections with regard to how do we maintain this? How do we, you know, test it? How do we, but you know, we might be able to get away with just nightly builds pulling everything from everybody and know early and often whether somebody broke something, right? A lot of other systems do nightly builds across all of the stuff that they're working on. And I think we could, we could probably put something very similar in place. I really thought what I proposed was more radical than this. <laughs> uh, just, I guess you were saying this is like not something that could be done until Drupal 9 cycle. But like, is there thoughts on like this from, maybe I'm totally wrong, but there's, this is really like, it's, it's the, the core packaging needs to change on Drupal or not, not an easy thing by any means. Mm -hmm. And the habits of core developers need to change to actually start be you know, running Composer install as part of their they should probably be doing that at this point anyway. But it doesn't need uh, it doesn't need a restructure of how like the, what the, the the layout of of what Drupal would be anyhow because there's the, the composer installers module and you can actually like you can still drop them into the same the same places um, basically so you could strip out modules as they exist now and forget about the you know proving people what the benefits are of actually componentizing in a different way which is like hey let's do how we always do and let's just uh, strip all these out into separate modules, separate yeah. packages, yeah. and then use Composer installer and drop them right into where they always are. But now you can have people in charge of, basically people in charge of, you know, the lieutenants of those, of those modules. Are now, it's now up to them how they want to start thinking differently and working differently and putting, you know, separating their pieces out so that maybe people outside the Drupal community can use it. It doesn't have to be a whole cohesive, let's move everything as a, as a single unit sort of thing. Right, I think, I think we're gonna have to stage out the code that we can extract over a period of time because as you begin to abstract code, um, 
you know, determining whether that's a cohesive piece that, that is useful is, is really, I mean, that takes a little bit of effort. You think like, let's take user, for example, right? If there were a user class or interface or something like that, that the entire PHP world could just say, we're using this, right? You would have user interoperability across like everybody's platform. Now, it's not likely that that's going to happen, but you begin actually considering that as you start to abstract our own user module out and you say, oh, we have session stuff. Are we going to use Symfony sessions? Are we going to roll our own session that sits on top of the Symfony components? What are we going to do here? You know, we have accounts and we have permissions and what's the difference between authentication and authorization and the list goes on and on. And it's like, that's a lot of work. And I was only really talking about user, okay. right? We didn't even talk about entity, which is dependent upon. I, I guess it's just more so that-, that Or that fields. Um, that we can think about our order of operations. Is it that we make each of these components useful to everyone else and then think about changing how we package it and build it? Or is it that we just like, without changing, without making it useful to anyone else at all from the get-go, just we can separate them out into, into packages and then, well, I mean, that's what modules are to a certain degree. The, like, let that fuel people to want to rebuild it in a different way. And it can happen a lot sooner, I guess. And then, well, I, but, anyway. but what's the difference between that and just maintaining the status quo? Uh, well, I, I think using a package manager really catalyzes a lot of changes that, you know, and, and people don't, you know, they, they don't get on board until they actually start using it. So right, so you're saying use Composer, but don't bother with making it work with anything but Drupal. Not yet, and just assume that that will be driven by the fact well, that maybe. people see the benefits and they realize, oh, I can just separate this out into its own package. And Sure, yeah. sure. I, I mean, like, to a certain degree, that makes some sense. Uh, there, there is a hard problem that I haven't mentioned yet uh, with regard to this, and I've been thinking about it a little bit. Um, but, you know, if you look at, say, who in the room has installed Symphony Full Stack? like four people. Um, so if you look at Symphony Full Stack, they do this thing where they have bundles. Bundles are exactly what I'm talking about, right? Um, and that's, that's great, but uh, <laughs> from the perspective of like modules and the things we do with them, we do some really crazy crap with modules. Like we can segment the modules you're using per site. We can segment the modules you're using per profile we can just drop them into a common spot. You can have the same module exist in all three of those places and we only use one, depending upon the site you're running or the profile, depending upon granularity. I mean, we support multi-site. So, you know, this is, this is uh, an interesting thing because like if you look at Symphony's setup, at least as far as I understand full stack thus far, and I don't claim to be an expert there, um, they just have like a source dir that you toss all this stuff into. And like the disadvantage is that everything I just said like totally isn't gonna work in that case. But the advantage of it is that they know exactly where all their classes are at all times. If you look at our module system and the way it works in Drupal 8 right now, the namespaced classes we have access to are all added later. Composer doesn't know about them. And so we can't get the full benefit of things like building a class map and knowing where every single class is and not needing to do a file exist check on every single class before we load it. Um, so, you know, there are little things like that and we probably have to make some concessions. But like, those are the sort of things that are gonna ultimately end up being like the hairy implementation details of componentizing our code. Larry. So, an earlier step that I think is more important you can use Composer with a module today in Drupal 7. And I have written modules for Drupal 7 where most of the logic is in a standalone PHP library written for that project. It's up on packages, and then there's a Drupal module that just bridges to it. And so so you're really code. suggesting like leveraging modules as adapters? It modules as glue code to bring in a third party library. Problem. Module? What's that? Which module is that? Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, there's PHP library that does the actual talking to the Rotten Tomatoes API using Guzzle. I didn't actually do it the best way I could have in hindsight, but it does work. Um, and then there's a Drupal module that does, all right, using that data, dump data from Rotten Tomatoes into Drupal. It's kind of cool. I'm doing exactly that for the Diablo 3 API right now. Sweet. <laughs> Notice our priorities. Yes. <laughs> but, and here's the problem. 
core <coughs> doesn't provide any way, even in Drupal 8, for modules to pull in composer libraries like that as a first class operation. And the big challenge to doing so is composer assumes you have shell access. Drupal yep. cannot assume you have shell access to install a module. Right. That's a problem we need to solve. Solve, yeah. Even if we do nothing else in terms of sharing code with the rest of the world, that's a problem we need to solve to encourage module developers to write less Drupal specific code. Yeah. I wish I had an answer to that that was easy, but I don't. don't if anyone right has now, yeah. one, please share it because I'd love to have one. I think there's that there So compo the way composer works, you have a make file essentially, a composer JSON file that specifies this is what this package is and here's its other dependencies and so forth. And you install packages with composer by running a command line tool that downloads the files, puts them in the right place, and sets up an autoloader that knows where all of them are. That's great if you have shell access to run that composer command. Drupal, by design, lets you install a module by just FTPing it in with that's the only access you have. Or by going through the UI and just dropping a URL into a you know, web form, and it downloads the module for you and installs it using some weird, funky, uh, screwy logic to keep it secure. Ish. Ish. <laughs> yeah, the, the ish is the problem. Because <coughs> if, you know, I, if I want to install that Rotten Tomatoes module, then I can't really do so unless I have shell access. Because right now, every module will have its own composer file. I have to go into that module directory and run composer manually and then install the composer autoload module. Actually, can't you just do that from, uh, from core? And it, like, if you do that, doesn't it go down and look for composer.json files everywhere? No. With Drupal 8. Really? I'm pretty sure I saw KMP demo exactly that. Uh, it recursively looks at composer JSON files referenced from the composer JSON file. But if you have. OK. Yeah, if you, if you today in Drupal 8 have the composer JSON file that ships with core and one down in a module somewhere and you run composer install in the root directory, that module is, is not even relevant. OK. Because cool. it's not being referenced from that global composer file. So I would love to use Composer more, but Drupal being at the top rather than being itself a library the way it is in an app, way Symfony would be an application framework, I don't know how to get around these problems. But well, I, and I really want to. And you know, there there are a couple other things that are worth mentioning here. Like the second Composer knows about your code, you can load it, whether <laughs> the module that it belongs to is turned on or not. <laughs> Now we don't have this problem in Drupal 8 because as I said, module, module namespaces are added to the autoloader later. They aren't in Composer. But in a system where Composer is actually managing that, which is what I'm proposing, you could have code that you didn't have enabled, but you could say new and give it a class name and that would instantiate. Um, and that's, I mean, like on the one hand, that's like OMG, on the other hand, it's like, well, it's a class that's in your library of code. Whether you have code that is actively executing it or not, and appropriately dependency injecting it, and all these other things that you would get by turning it on is a completely different discussion. But it's worth mentioning that that is a change. Like, you can't do that in Drupal today. You can't say, give me some class out of this disabled module. I mean, you could, I guess, if you you know manually included the file, but... Because that's what Composer's doing for you at that point, is it, it knows where it exists, whether it was turned on or not, so it can manually include the file. Does that make sense? One other note, the Drupal component directory exists exactly for this reason, yes. so that we could do the exact same split logic that Symfony's doing. Uh, that was very deliberate, and that's why that, that split exists for that purpose. And that is probably worth showing. Oh. I, I can take the blame for writing that readme file. Okay, which is why you knew about it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Core, lib, Drupal. Why didn't I capitalize that? What in the world? C, core, lib. Okay. Uh,
Yeah, actually, I'll, sh I'll show you exactly what Larry's talking about. Um, so this is the component library. You may not be able to see this. Maybe, maybe that's better. Uh, so we have like annotation, archiver, bridge, date time, diff, discovery, you know, and so on. Um, really like, excuse me for a moment. Pah, you got committed. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's great news for me. Uh, so yeah, so anything in here could ideally be separated out. Um, I've been working towards um, getting the plugin system, the annotation system, and the utility system all separated out. And I know what my evening is going to consist of since that patch landed. Um, but but we could do that with any of these, assuming that they've been kept pure and don't actually make calls to other Drupal classes or anything like that. And um, by and large, the coverage on, on making sure that doesn't happen in here has been pretty good. Um, I think the people who have, have been you know, heavily responsible for creating these directories have generally been consulted before patches went into them and they've reviewed them and said no you can't do that or change it to this or you know stuff like that so uh, by and large I, I think that this is a really good first step for us um, what upsets me and probably Larry uh, is that you know there, there's a lot more here in core uh, amongst them database which is like almost perfectly usable outside of Drupal core <laughs> um, it, it needs a little bit of, of love to migrate over to component, but um, there are a lot of things in here that uh, to some degree could be seriously considered for having stuff abstracted out of them and put into component. And what you see here is, uh, you'll see there is actually a plugin directory here. And the plugin directory in here is going to extend a whole bunch of things that were provided by component, and they're gonna provide a bunch of Drupal assumptions on top of them. That's pretty like, sustainable way to go about build a component, add Drupal's assumptions. Build a component, add Drupal's assumptions. Um, it's worked very well in the couple of places that we've used it thus far, and um, I, I think there's probably a lot of code sitting inside of core that just was not, the, the people doing it at the time were either uh, under too big of a deadline to bother abstracting it to that level, or you know didn't feel comfortable trying to conform to it, I don't know. Uh, because I wasn't involved in a lot of these, but there are a lot of these that could probably ultimately move into the component library um, given a bit of effort. And you can see how much code we've already done in Drupal 8 that is moving this direction we, before we've even touched uh, modules. And, you know, if I go up here, like, we still have an includes directory with a whole bunch of stuff in it, and much of this ultimately, not all of it probably, but a lot of it ultimately wants to be moving into that class-based componentized architecture that is reusable. Um, I find myself being interested in what is in utility. How many lines is this? Oh, it's 25. <laughs> so someone file an issue to replace all Drupal var exports with static calls to variable export, and we can get rid of this file, right? I wonder why this exists. But there's gonna be quite a bit of that sort of stuff, because we've just got some cruft from trying to build out these sorts of systems. Um, let's see, I said I was going to, that's in core vendor, right? <coughs> So these are all of the real legitimate components we actually have uh, in Drupal today. And, um, well, that's not entirely true. Oh, oh, oh. I've got that on a separate tab. Yay! <laughs> these right here are all the components that we actually have within Drupal 8 today. So we have, you know, whew. I didn't know I could do that in Vim. There we go. So we have uh, a bunch of Symphony stuff, and then we have Twig, 
of course, and Doctrine, and Guzzle, and Ascetic, uh, some stuff from Symphony CMF, and so on. Uh, so when I look here, like that, this directory was generated directly in response to the file we just looked at. Um, and so, you know, we have a Symphony directory. And in the Symphony directory, we have class loader and debug and we're, we're in fact we're going to have a couple of things in here that aren't in that require statement because they were subsequently required by other symphony components um, so interesting things there uh, but what Larry was talking about was that if we if we look in here there's an auto load PHP right and so I can look at that and this is a generated file. We are generating PHP in Drupal 8. And this is just returning this generated class's static method git loader. And so if we go into uh, Composer, you're gonna find that we have a number of, uh, of PHP files here that have been generated. And so the one it was looking at was auto load real which has that crazy class name again, and it's going to have the git loader, which does all of this sort of stuff. But most importantly, we have this namespaces dir, which actually knows where all your classes for a particular namespace live. That's really cool. You want to see something cooler? This is a class map of every class that exists within any of our vendors. It knows exactly where they live. And so when you ask for a vendor class name, it doesn't even have to do a file exists check on these. It already verified they're there. It just loads the file and hands you the class. I'm not even out of the Ds yet. It's long. I'm like 257 lines in. It is 2,286 lines long. Right, so there are a lot of classes in here. If you think of those each being as one class for one line, which is what it is. Um, so that's not including any of the modules classes. No module classes in here. So we don't get the benefit of them being in the class map, which is exactly one of the benefits we would get from adopting this sort of a strategy. So um, let's see, why does that keep coming up? We've got about 15 more minutes, I think. Anybody have any additional comments they want to toss out? Just seeing that class map, I think we removed the ability to disable modules now in Drupal 8. So it should be easier for us to build a class map, right? Well, we still have the problem of we don't actually know where the class exists, like where the module exists, because yeah. there are like a dozen different places it technically can but exist. We know and the class map's only for your 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 code base, not for your site. If we can figure out how to build a class map per site, then we might be able to get away with that. Exactly. Site is actually what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I'm just going to troll you. Okay. <laughs> Licensing. Discuss. Oh. Anybody else? <laughs> so an, an awful lot of the code that we have included is uh, MIT, right? Yeah. Some's uh, MIT, some's BSD. Some's MIT, some's BSD. All of it's dual licensed GPL though for us, isn't it? No? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but some of it is. Like they did for Symphony, didn't they? No. No? Symphony straight up MIT. Okay. So yeah, there's there's a war raging and we are caught in the middle. Um, and I have no clue whose side I'm on. So, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I've thought about this a lot with plugins and plugins was birthed out of Drupal 8. And even if I thought, hey, MIT is great, which I'm not sure I do, but supposing I did, um, I don't think I can likely ever make that MIT. Right, and CHX is probably not on board, which is fine, right? I mean, like, you, you know that going in. You say, okay, we're building stuff for Drupal. It's GPL2+. So I know. Oh, that's actually another thing. 
I've, I've wondered for a long time whether we were, you know, 2 or 2 plus or whatever. Um, yeah, edit it anyway. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> right? Uh, anyway, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, Drupal components are probably going to need to be GPL 2 plus, right? Like, that's just what makes sense. And if we end up getting to a point where modules go away and we're adopting this more componentized frameworky approach, then we may find ourselves with a mixture of code on any given site beyond what's already defined for Drupal 8, right? Uh, we may find that, you know, it, it's, it's not like the need for Drupal.org goes away and all of the sort of code maintenance that we've done there because that's still very valuable. And I, I think that, you know, we're going to continue hosting things there and those things obviously are going to continue to be GPL because we strictly say if you're uploading it to our Git server, it's GPL2+, right? I mean, that's what you agree to. So anybody who continues to think of what they're doing as being Drupal is just going to continue to use that license. And anybody who decides to go out onto GitHub or, you know, Bitbucket or I don't know where, like they're going to have to actually make that decision for themselves. Um, I'm not sure it actually ends up affecting us a whole lot because I, I think you know, that, that ship probably sailed a decade ago or something, right? Uh, um, unless we decide to just redo everything as three, you know, there's not a lot of a licensing discussion to have around, around Drupal specific components. We're abstracting them out of Drupal already. How much effort would it be to go around and find every single person who's to blame for that code before we abstracted it into a component and then get them to agree to something else? No, it's GPL2+. My, my impression was that uh, if we don't we don't need to store the other external libraries, it doesn't matter what they are. So if we're only like if we're only storing the composer files, doesn't that get around it? Or is it does it does anyone know if when we build it, if we host a tarball with the built version, is that technically against? You deserve this, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, MIT and BSD licensed code are um, non copyleft licenses; they're permissive licenses. So technically speaking, it is legal for us to redistribute that code under the GPL if we wanted to. We still have the MIT copyright statements that they come with, and our license file says, you know, includes these other uh, libraries under their own licenses. So I, it, if you put a gun to my head, I couldn't actually tell you if technically speaking you're getting them under MIT or GPL when you download from Drupal.org. I will tell you, it doesn't actually matter to anyone who's not even more of a pedant than I am. And that's saying a great deal. Uh, the bigger question is more, if Drupal starts breaking out our code into components, either the ones we have now, or if we start writing new ones in the future, do we think about saying, hey, this new component we are about to write, we want to make under MIT or LGPL or something so that it can be used by more people? Maybe, maybe not. You'll find very loud, very angry people on both sides of that question. But if we start developing any of these outside of the existing Drupal repository, that question becomes a valid question to ask. Yeah, but I mean, to a certain degree, this, this is a holy war. And mm -hmm. I, you know. That's why I said I'm trolling you by asking it. Right, yeah. Um, and and I, am, I am apathetic, and I'm not sure I have a god in this war. So, you know. Um, yeah, I guess to, to a certain degree, um, I can see both sides of it. Um, you know, you just have to figure out which one you think is short-sighted and go with the other. I think the, the easy answer for right now, the easy step we can take is throw a bunch of Composer JSON files into all of the Drupal component libraries and do the same kind of split Symfony does. That doesn't take any effort at all, doesn't change our development process in the slightest, but still gets the code out somewhere. Yeah, I, I think that that's a... a really good discussion to have offline because I was intending on just creating my own repos and tossing composer JSONs in there and just keeping those repos up to date with Drupal core. Let's just file a patch against the core and yell at trees a lot. I'm okay with that. <laughs> we, I guess we documented that. Um, so yeah, any other questions at this point? Uh, we have about 10 more minutes, so I mean, you can troll me further. 
we can end early and you can go seeking coffee. I can stand up here and show you plugins. I mean, we could do a whole bunch of things. What about when you said you were just thinking of extracting all the plugins out? Mm hmm. Modules would lead, need a, a whole lot more effort. No, like, I, I guess I'm saying, like, they don't actually need any effort because the Poser installer doesn't, like, just, just dropping the code in. It's like, not. It, it, like, there are, there are implications with regard to namespacing and other stuff there. It just drops it into the modules. So, no, it, it doesn't. It, it drops. Can, can I, like, can I say. There's a special project for. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a project called. Um, Composer installers, and it's basically someone creating something to allow Composer to to allow you to drop things like Drupal modules into place and drop things like Type Three, whatever they're called, plugins. Type yeah, Type Three. So th it's for like this one installers repo helps you resolve this problem for like pretty much every framework out there. Interesting. So, I, I know nothing of it, but uh, I'm super interested yeah, so to see it. It can be like a zero effort. Like this can just everything can be turned into components. And sorry, that's what I was talking about before when I was saying like we could just split it out, not re-architect anything and just let that incentivize the, the change in how we think about the modules. Okay. The problem there is again the how do you install it without uh, command line. If we install all of our modules by telling people, hey, go to the composer JSON file in the root directory, add a line to it for the module you want to use and rerun composer install, then what you're describing would work wonderfully. Well, yeah, we but can't this, actually say that yet. this actually gives you the ability to use Composer in order to compose your <laughs> your modules together. But like, just because we added Composer.json files to all of the repos for modules does not mean that DrushDL stops working or any of our other solutions, right? True. Yeah. It, it's more a matter of just adding that Composer.json file doesn't actually have benefit, I think. I guess that depends upon how robust this solution is. Yeah. Because if, if I can do something like say, I want you to get this this module and I want you to put it in this directory <coughs> that's the modules dir inside the contributor inside of the modules dir inside of, you know, the open atrium profile. I mean, then it, I could begin building class maps off of yeah, that. If data. we could actually use, you know, the composer JSON file and you know the replace drush make with, hey, go edit the JSON file in Drupal root and say that's not hacking core, then that might be a very interesting thing to do. I don't know if that will work or not. I, I guess there are just a lot of really interesting things that could be done at this point. I was completely unaware of this, but this opens up a lot of interesting ideas. Because it, it's right now, I, like the, the <coughs> installers project, Composer installers, isn't very, I'm not sure if this is not, uh, it isn't very robust. Talk more directly because, into it. Oh, gotcha. There you uh, go. well, I don't think it's very robust and it pretty much only takes one um, install path and no one's really been like well, the, then the we need to com commit Drupal. an upstream patch. I mean, yeah, yeah. So right, right now, it could work if we're saying, "Hey, we just want to treat core modules like this. We're going to test out this approach. We're using Composer and Core already. Like, contrib would be a whole. You know, we need to fix up the installers thing and make it so it could actually have two different mm -hmm. modules directories that it can that it can drop into. Anyway, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna let you all go like five minutes early. So thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate it. Oh, oh, and uh, <laughs> please tell them I did a good job. <laughs> oh, oh, this is this is sprinting. This is what did you think? Oh, look at that! It's got animations. All right, yeah. So, so I, I guess I, I do have a, a couple more minutes. So yes, please tell them I did a good job. Go take the survey. Um, I could use the karma, and then there is a sprint on Friday. Uh, so uh, I was asked to tell you all this and I will happily do so because you should absolutely be at the sprint on Friday. Uh, we'll be doing lots and lots of stuff. Uh, we have tasks for every skill set. Mentors available for new contributors. I'm not going to do any more of the sales pitch. You all know it. <laughs>